Hello, my name is Kyle Hamilton with Predictive Engineering, and this is our first workshop in our Foundations of FEA Modeling training class. In this video, we're going to cover some basic introductions to FEMAP and do one complete analysis workflow. Opening up FEMAP, the first thing you'll notice is this tip of the day. I'd recommend reading through here at least once, catching all the new uh, features that have been added to FEMAP in here. Uh, after a while, it can get kind of annoying having it pop up um, when you first open up FEMAP each time. So when you're done with it, you can uncheck this show tips at startup and click close and it won't pop up anymore. So let's take a look at how FEMAP is organized. Uh, all of these windows here are organized into panes. You've got your model info tree, you've got an entity editor, your messages. You can shift these around to make them taller or shorter. You can grab these toolbars or the pane and drag it out. Um, you can double click it to send it back where it came from. If you don't want to see it anymore, you can click this little X to close. And if you want to open up the, the same one you closed or additional panes, you can go up to tools. And we close the entity editor. Let's open up this entity info pane. And let's go ahead and drag it up to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, when you're dragging it around, you'll notice uh, you can just drop it into space or you can snap it to different areas using these arrows here. And I'd recommend playing with it a little bit and seeing the, what the different arrows do. Um, it can be a little tricky until you get a hang of it. Uh, if you open it up in space, let's just go ahead and double click this to send it back to the snapped position. The next important area for your functionality in FEMAP is these toolbars. The toolbars are similar to the panes in that you can click and drag them around to reposition them. You can double click to send them back. And if you have it out, you can click this little X to close it. Uh, if you've closed one that you want to get back, you can go to Tools, Toolbars, and then I think that was the Select Toolbar that I had turned off. And we can double click the toolbar to send it back to the dock. <clears throat> we can add custom tools to the toolbars by right clicking up in the toolbar area and select Customize. And you can turn on and off your toolbars up in this area. Let's go ahead and move over to commands. And I want to add a command from the file menu. And this is that rebuild function. And to add it to the toolbar, you just click it and drag to the position you want it in the toolbar. With it dragged in there, you can click close and it's automatically saved. <coughs> FEMAP preferences can be found under file preferences. Uh, the Messages tab allows you to customize how the text shows up in your message pane. In the Views, you can choose your startup view. After you've created a custom view in FEMAP and saved it, you can choose the, the view number here by clicking on these little three-dot box to select it from a list. One setting, I make sure, make sure to, one setting I make sure to change in every FEMAP installation is this Resolution button under Picture Save Defaults. Instead of uh, the copy resolution being the screen resolution, I like to scale my screen resolution by four. And this creates higher resolution images, which can be a little bit more crisp in the reports when you drop them in. Select OK. Next up is our graphics. I'll generally leave these at their default values. Um, if you've got a large, complicated geometry and it's not rotating right and you have some bad performance, you can change uh, your include and dynamic rotation checkboxes and just start removing things to um, speed up that rotation a little bit. In the user interface tab, most of these I leave at their default values. Some important ones are dynamic zoom around cursor location and dynamic rotate around cursor location. Uh, by default, FEMAP has you choose a point or a node to uh, rotate about. Um, if you just check these boxes, it'll rotate around your cursor position, which seems a little bit more intuitive for me and it matches up with some other popular CAD packages. If you've created your custom toolbar layouts, you can save them here or load previously saved layouts. And you can also reset your user interface here. Under the database tab, uh, the only one that I really change in here 
is the scratch directory. Um, by default, it puts it into a temp location. And I like to tell it where to put this, because this is where it's going to put all of my uh, temporary model files. So let's click on the little boxes there to expand, and we'll choose our scratch folder. So this is C slash scratch. Under solvers, if you're using Abacus, Ansys, or Dyna, you can choose uh, you can choose the program files where those are located. Moving on to geometry slash model, you can choose your default import scale factor. Um, we'll leave this as inches, and we'll leave everything else at the default values under here. Under interfaces, um, you can choose the default solver and analysis type in here. Uh, the two options I make sure to change are the 64-bit NASTRAN. I don't think there's any uh, engineering machine that doesn't use a 64-bit processor these days, so go ahead and check that box, unless you're using a 32-bit processor. And under the direct output to, instead of model file directory, I'll change that to specified directory, and we'll choose our scratch directory again. Okay. Um, next up, our results. Uh, we can you can change how the results are imported in the fee map here. We'll just leave this at the default for now. This is where you can edit your libraries. If you've got multiple material libraries or view libraries, you can uh, select those in here. Uh, every time you create a custom view, it gets saved to your view library that you have selected, and so on with your materials and properties. Under colors, you can choose the default colors for different entities in your model. We'll leave those at their default values. And finally, if you have a space ball, uh, the space ball tab is where you're going to find those custom settings for your space ball. <clears throat> now that we've got our settings all selected, we're ready to import some geometry and run through our analysis. Let's start by going to File, Import, Geometry. And note that we're not opening our geometry. Since this is a parasolid file, we're going to import it. And we're in workshop one, so we'll grab this landing gear file, select OK to open. And let's leave our scale factor at the default inches for now, and select OK. Now that this geometry has imported, let's, let's measure the diameter of this hole really quick and make sure that it's the right size. So let's click Measure. And we want to measure from this point here to this point. But you'll notice nothing's really happening when I mouse over this point. So I don't really know how to grab it. To grab those points, we right click on the screen and select Snap to Point. And we can choose a point on one side, select OK, and then a point on the other side, select OK. Now down here, this is some uh, results popped up in our message window. But the, the measure tool popped up again. And we can just click Cancel to close. It's just reopening. So if we wanted to measure multiple things, we could do it again without having to keep clicking the Measure button. So the total distance is 4 inches. That sounds about right for this geometry. Some quick model navigation chips. Uh, in order to rotate the model, you just middle click your mouse button and move your mouse around, and it'll rotate. If you want to pan, you hold the control key, middle click the mouse button, and you can drag it around. And to zoom, you can hold the shift key, click the middle mouse button, and drag, go up and down um, to zoom in and out. You can also scroll the middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out. It's a little less precise. So with our geometry imported, the first thing we want to do is create our materials and properties. So let's expand model in the model info tree and create a new material. You can right click on material and select new. And it's an isotropic material. So let's go ahead and load something from our material library. And let's load some 2024 aluminum. And this material in the library already has the modulus, Poisson's ratio, everything's all filled out already. And it has a title. So we can go ahead and click OK. And let's hit Cancel to close this dialog. Next up is our property. Let's right click, New Property. 
And by default, it's asking us to create a plate element type, but we want a solid element. So let's click this element slash property type button and go down to volume elements and choose solid. Select OK. We'll choose our material. Is that 2024 aluminum? And this is solid aluminum. OK. And you can see property one created. So we can hit cancel to close. With our material and property created, we're ready to set our mesh size. So let's expand geometry. Right click on your geometric solid and select mesh size. Since this is just a first pass, we'll choose tip meshing and our default element size. And let's leave everything else at default. Select OK. And you'll notice these little bubbles popped up along the curves. And these little bubbles designate the mesh sizing. That looks reasonable for a geometry that looks like this. So let's go ahead and run with that. Um, with the mesh sizing set, you can right click on your geometry and select tet mesh. This will actually apply the mesh to the geometry. Uh, it, by default, it shows our solid aluminum property and we can leave everything else at their default values. Select OK. So now we've got our mesh on this geometry and things are starting to look a little hectic here with all of our nodes and elements and surfaces and curves. So let's go up to view visibility. And I, I just want to see my surfaces because I'm going to apply my boundary conditions to the surfaces. So let's turn everything off and we'll just turn on surfaces. Select OK. Now with our surfaces shown, let's go and create our loads and constraints and then we'll be ready to analyze. First up, we'll create our load, right click, new load set, and this will be load set one. Select OK. Now it created our load set, but not our actual loads. We'll select load definition, right click on surface, and uh, we'll put a load on this top surface here. Uh, now, it looks kind of weird when I'm trying to grab the surface. I can get it if I move the mouse right in the center of it, but you can make this easier by right clicking and instead of pick normal, choose pick front. And this will choose uh, the surface that's directly in front of the mouse. And we can be a little bit more confident that we're grabbing the right surface. So go ahead and select that surface there at the top of the circle. And we can click this highlight button to preview it. And that looks like the right surface. Uh, I kind of glossed over this entity selection box at first. So let's take a look. Um, this box is the dialog that you'll see really commonly in Femap. It's the dialog that's used to select surfaces, nodes, elements, uh, curves, pretty much everything that you need to select will use this dialog box to select it. So get used to this interface. Um, there's a lot of good functionality in here. Let's go ahead and turn off highlighter and we can select OK to continue. We're creating a force and let's go ahead and put 1,000 pounds in the negative Z direction. So we'll do negative 1,000 pounds. We can give this force a title. Let's say negative 1,000 pounds Z direction. Hit enter to close out of that dialog. And if we expand our load definitions, you can see this negative 1,000 pound force added. Next up is our constraints. We'll right click on constraints, select new, and this will be constraint set one. Okay, now we'll right, right click on constraint definition and we'll add some constraints on the surface. So this landing gear strut sits inside of some bearings and then it presses up against another surface up top here. So we want to create these bearing surfaces first. So let's select these four surfaces there. We can highlight to preview and select OK. Now, we can fix them, we can pin them, but what we really want to do is uh, simulate that they're, they're, they're able to rotate and slide but aren't able to grow within that bearing. So we can go down here to our cylinder slash hole constraint type and check the box for constrain radial growth. And let's give this a title as bearing constraint. Okay, and then we can select okay to continue. 
Now, you'll notice we can't see our constraints or our loads. And uh, we know that they exist in the model because they're over here in our model info tree. But let's go up to view visibility. And we can turn on our loads and our constraints. And then we can visualize where they're at. Select done. So now we can see our 1,000 pound load and our radial constraints on these bearing surfaces. Uh, we need another constraint to fully constrain this thing. So let's create another constraint on a surface. And let's choose this top surface here. We can highlight to preview and select OK. And let's fix this top surface. We'll just call this fixed surface. And select OK. So now we've got our forces, constraints. We've got our mesh, which we turned off. Let's go ahead and turn that back on, view visibility. We'll turn on our elements and turn off our surface. Select done. And we're ready to analyze. To analyze, we'll right click on our analysis, manage, and then create a new analysis. We're using NX Navstrand, and this is a static analysis type. We'll give this a title, static analysis one. You can select OK, and all of the settings will go to their default values. Um, if you want to confirm that you grabbed the right boundary conditions, we can expand this master requests and conditions area, and then expand boundary conditions. And it looks like we grabbed constraint set one and load set one. So now we're ready to analyze. We'll go ahead and click the Analyze button. And we never saved it, so we'll go ahead and save now. Uh, we'll call this landing gear and go ahead and replace it. While this thing is solving, we can look at our, our matrix solver, our FO4 file, and our FO6 file to see what's going on in there. Uh, it looks like it solved pretty quickly, 13 seconds. Uh, let's go ahead and auto-hide our analysis monitor pane here. Uh, if we close it, we can't really get it back unless we uh, re reanalyze this thing. So we'll click auto-hide. It snaps to the edge there. Uh, so let's look at some of these results. If we expand our results set, this thing is bolted, so we know it's active. Let's go over to our post-processing toolbox. And we can select our contour style. Let's go ahead and contour. And let's also select our deformation and deform it. So down here in the corner, you can see it shows output set NX Nastran case one. It deformed by the total translation and it's contouring the solid von Mises stress. If we want to turn off the deformation and contour all in one click, you can choose this set to undeformed, no contour, no free body button, and it turns it back to the default display. Well, there you go. This, that is your first analysis workflow. Thank you very much, and have fun modeling.